Libby Burrell, so good to see you. Welcome to my little show. You've played such a massive part in my life since 1980 when I met you. I can't wait to find out what happened before 1980 because after 1980, I've been following quite a lot of your career and it's been very interesting and we'll touch on different things from swimming to running to triathlon to just motivation. But yeah, tell me, good. where did it start? I know you were part of a family of four kids, but your mom and dad were also incredible sports people. So I guess it started with them back in PE. Yeah, well, I'm the youngest of four children and I'm probably the, the least illustrious of all of them as far as swimming prowess goes, um, but probably just carried on and persisted for longer. Um, my dad um, was a great athlete. He was actually the South African junior record holder for the mile. He also swam. They were in the days where kids did everything at school. Um, he did high board diving. He played hockey, field hockey. He played rugby and um, he was a, a great runner, a mile runner. And um, obviously also had swimming. I, the other day I sent Quibus a whole lot of the programs from his school swimming days. He was a hoarder. So he collected everything, unlike me that collects nothing. <laughs> um, mom, mom was a hockey player. She played a mean game of tennis. She was pretty athletic in her own sense. But um, I had, my eldest sister, Wendy, was a great swimmer. Unfortunately, also swam in the bad times where you couldn't go to the Olympic Games. And uh, she was South African record holder. I, I'm a terrible historian, but from what I know, she broke South African records 11 times. Um, she was just a tiny little girl. They used to call her the pocket battleship in the water. Um, and she swam great. And and uh, my second eldest sister, uh, Joy, was a breaststroke swimmer. My brother was a great swimmer, also a breaststroker. And, and I just followed them. And it was just a long line. I think my parents decided from a young age, um, throw us in the water, make us tired, swim twice a day. And we have less problems at home with kids. And we all just fell in love with it. And, and that's what we did. So that's part and part of the Burrell family. And I believe my dad's two sisters he was the only boy in the family were also swimmers okay. so there's a long line of barrel swimmers okay so at what age did you start getting professional coaching and and who was your first professional coach okay. i um i think i was just a little bitty girl um that i used to sit alongside the swimming pool when my my siblings were swimming um I believe I swam, um, I started swimming with a professional coach, um, probably one of the, the legends of South African coaching, um, Peter Elliott. Yeah. I believe I was maybe just five um, when I started swimming. Um, we were, he had the great group. Um, Peter Elliott used to be in the textile industry and, and um, he was, he showed himself as being a, a fantastic coach and a group of people. I think my dad was part of that group, encouraged him to go all out. Um, he built his own pool um, in Warmer, Port Elizabeth, um, and eventually a second pool and then a third teaching pool. Um, and so I was very fortunate to be part of that group. I swam with him right up until nine these days in South Africa. Um, and then I moved over to another legendary coach um tom connell um, yes. he was the gray high school coach and bowed down and and allowed a girl to join the group and okay. i was the oldie in the group and the likes of the late um, andre kotzer um, richard maybury then people like andrew dean kuba skippers they were all part of the group and i was just the lone girl um, he was a, a really specialist breaststroke coach as well as being a sprint coach and i decided to experienced the change before I ventured off to Stellenbosch University. Um, and um, I had always dreamt of the, the crazy Dutch woman um, from Cape Town being my coach. And I dreamt of being in Clara Oric's squad. And so I went there and got used to her prior to logging in or clocking in on my first day at Stellenbosch University, which was a culture shock for an English girl from a pucker English school going to Stellenbosch University in those days. So that's really the, the history. And, and, you know, Tace, one of the things that I will say is that everything that I've done in my life was a step ladder to somewhere else. I, I often hear now, because I, I think we'll speak about that later, about what I do now professionally, but of people who've experienced coaches that were harsh or didn't uh, treat them well or yeah. something. 
I was really blessed. Um, between Peter Elliott, Tom Connell, and Clara Oric, um, and then later on when I was a triathlete, I just jumped into the pool with Santa, I found Jasfeld, and I experienced the best. And, and they were really my education in, into coaching. They taught me what I wanted to be and what I didn't want to be as a coach. And so even though I knew I wasn't a great swimmer, I always knew that the path was leading to something. I think I was in standard three when I decided I'd go to Stellenbosch and study phys ed and I would one day be an Olympic coach. Yeah. And everybody laughed at me and said, South Africa doesn't go to the Olympics, so you're wasting your time. So that was really the pathway for me. So, so I met you in 1980 and uh, one of the, the, the only reason I went to Paul Gymnasium, which gave me so much joy, was because there was a coach in Paul called Libby Burrell. And she had Libby squat with a with the green track suits. I will never forget that. So as a standard seven boy from Vintuk, myself and my sister joined your club, which I think was established about a year or two before that, from, from what I can remember. It was already an established it club was, when we joined. Yeah, it was an established club. Actually, another one, and I'm not sure if you have had the opportunity to connect with Kies Juncker was um, the coach of the Paul Club. He left. Um, and I went um, to, um, I, to teach. I was a high school teacher um, at Paul Girls High. Um, and somebody said to me, please, will you coach at the club? And I'm, I kind of knew that that is what I wanted to do, got permission from the school to also do that as a sideline activity. And, and that's really what happened. Yeah, I mean, we swam in the old Paul swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool, and uh, I still very... Uh, fondly remember our, our kickoff of, of our summer season was always a summer a training camp at Khodini Spa in the warm water pool. Um, yeah. We worked really hard, but we had an incredible amount of fun. Um, I remember the combi trips. I mean, Libby, you didn't only coach. I mean, you were the, the taxi driver. Those days, if it was Uber, you would have been the Uber driver. You drove us to the galas. You gave us massages. You gave us pep talks. You, you know, you just... You, you had to do everything. And I mean, you were young. You were quite young. You were under 30 when you started in, in, in Paul. Very much so. Yeah, very, very young then. Um, you had a couple of naughty boys in the squad as well. I wasn't yes. one of them, but I know some of them were. <laughs> well, I know some, some, of the, some of the kids that swam with me uh, had a love-hate relationship with me. Um, they hated me at swimming during the hard workouts. But they loved me when I could give them uh, letters for bunking out of the hostel at school. So um, I, we had good we had good times there. Um, you know, I I have contact with um, a number of swimmers um, from that day, um, and more especially right now with Richard and David de Villiers, um, I've got a connection with them. But and and they very kind in when they talk about um, the grounding that the swim club gave them. Sure. But, you know, I, I, I owe it to the swimmers that I had for being able to take the path that I took. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an overly confident person. I'm a harsh, harsh realist. It was hard for me to realize that I was never going to be a great swimmer, but I could still with hard work become a great coach. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what I wanted to do. And I'm not sure how aware you are of this one story. And obviously you know him really well. And um, I had um, a set of twins at the school that I taught at. And um, one of the twins came over. I never knew which one was which. And one of the Druma twins came over to me and said, um, I have a little brother and we think he can be a really good swimmer. We would like you to look at him. So I said, sure. And so they invited me to the Druma family home. And I met very tiny, at that stage, Noel Druma. And I had a look at him and there was something natural about what he did in the water as a backstroker. And so I said, if you, I told him, and I'm sure he remembers this, if you work really hard for a, and consistently for a long period of time, we can make something of you. Mm. And um, it happened to be later on in the years, um, everybody went away and Noel was really worried because he said, well, who are you going to coach if there's nobody, um, everybody's away on holiday, all the boarders are away on holiday. I'm like, I coach. I don't mind if one person is there or nobody's there, I turn up. And so we sat down, Benji, the late Benji Drummer and Noel and myself, and we plotted out how much we had to improve every single day before he could qualify for Curry Cup. And he did it. And 
that was the first time that I realized that if you plan really well, and, and I was really nervous because it was my first experience of taking somebody on that journey. You and, you and Ellen were already established swimmers. So that was really kind of the fun journey. So where I am today, I owe everything to the swimmers that gave me the opportunity to experiment on them. <laughs> So, well, so that really the experiment worked for all of us. And, and I mean, that's why we're still in touch. Uh, you, uh, a, a few years ago, we heard you were coming out to South Africa and it was one or two phone calls. And I think 30 or 40 of your uh, previously coached athletes. I mean, they, they're not your swimmers or they're your friends. You impacted our lives for, for so many good reasons. And I think that's why when, when we heard you were coming to South Africa, everybody dropped everything and they came out to that sort of reunion and that function. Right. <laughs> yeah. You gave me a lot of time away from the study halls, which I'm very grateful for. And uh, I drove with Noel Drummer and, and, and his dad sent a driver to pick me up at the boarding school. And we, I, I went to Paul to, to swim with you. But after a year, you left and you started coaching at Stellenbosch, which is, I think, a 30 kilometer or 40 kilometer drive away. And we gladly drove through every day. And, and you started the, the, the indoor swimming pool. You were the first one to coach there. Yeah, well, it's actually an interesting story. The person who was head of sport at that time, Jackie Visser, approached me and she came, came actually to visit me and she said, um, um, and she was primarily involved with hockey, but swimming was also in her portfolio at the sports office. And um, she asked me if I would be interested in starting an open club, considering that swimmers are so young, usually when they have to start out and get good grounding. And... Um, I decided that, that that would be quite a nice option um, because it would provide the swimmers with warm water. And, and so we could swim year round um, when the heater didn't go down, as you know. Um, the <laughs> heater went down often. It, was it didn't really chill. matter. We still swam. It was just cold. <laughs> what was exciting to me then is how many people decided that that was a good option. And in the end, I, I, I think you might know, I um, limited the senior group to 25 swimmers and the junior group to 25. 25 and I always had 20 to 30 people on the junior waiting list so nobody could really mess around on the junior group because I could just replace them um, and um, I was blessed with a, a stunning group of young swimmers um, it was a pretty exciting time I remember at Western Province Junior Championships I had about between six and eight young boys in the under 12 or and and then again in the under 14 section and I never knew which of the four were going to make the Western Province team because it just depended who was on on the day so that was really an exciting time of my life um it was a really good move and I was pretty sad to hear recently that um that I'm I believe the Māori Swim Club is no more um yeah. but I'm not sure how that has developed but um that was really another great learning opportunity for me crazy time for me because um when i started out i was teaching in paul i I'm sorry i was teaching at uwc yeah. at the university so i would drive from paul to some to stellenbosch to coach then as soon as i was finished coaching the morning session i'd go through to uwc lecture all day on the way home drop off and coach in the evening again and then drive back to paul and so it went on wow. six to seven days a week until we moved house to somerset west yeah. Incredible times. I mean, I, I remember those times so well. You also, you said you had a bunch of very talented uh, young swimmers, but you also were the reason for a lot of swimmers making sort of a, a, a comeback. I remember Lee McGregor joining us. I think Jane Weir joined us for a while, if I remember yes. well. Robert Skippers came to swim with us. Uh, yeah. There are probably other names that I can't remember now, but you always... Greg Carswell. Greg, I mean, Greg. Greg Carswell was at Stellenbosch University when he won the 100 meters in Cape Town. So um, I take no credit for him because his coaches were absolutely awesome. But he, um, I kind of administered the programs that he told me that he wanted to do. But um, he, was, he was with us. And yeah, that was really exciting. He must have been the best looking South African 100 meters champion ever. Yeah, I you know, I had a lot of very busy parents um, in the Stellenbosch <laughs> Junior Group who all decided to become spectators to every training session when Greg was on the pool deck. <laughs> so. I, I also have a, had a bit of a problem when I was doing surf lifesaving duties and I told my now wife, who was then my girlfriend, I said, uh, you know, I've got duty at Clifton. And she says, is Greg in your squad? Because then she'd always join me. Uh, Greg's <laughs> yeah. just a wonderful man. He's been yes. dodging my request to be on my show, but uh, we'll, we'll chat to him very soon. He's been helping me 
uh, to connect uh, amongst other with John T. Skinner. So he's, he's been a great help to me. Let me tell me when, when you moved to University of Stellum, uh, Western Cape, eventually you stopped coaching with us, but you coached there. And then all of a sudden I heard that Libby Burrell broke the Foot of Africa ladies half marathon record. How did that happen? Well, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, when I handed over the squad to Santa van Jaarsveld, um, and I just felt I, my swimmers were too good and I couldn't afford them the time with a full-time lecturing job. Um, I was heartbroken, really. I, every, every evening when it was swimming time, I was wondering what they were doing. Santa was really good. She would keep me informed how, how my oh. swimmers, who I regarded almost as my children, um, and so I just decided, to, uh, I remember Mariki, uh, you remember my best friend Mariki, and she said to me, you go and do something, go run or do yeah. something. And the first time I went out the front door, the furthest I could run was for seven minutes. And um, so I, I just persisted and um, lost weight. And so it felt pretty good. And, and I just kept myself busy. And I did the same diligence as I did with swim coaching. I started reading everything about it and what I needed to do. And then I hooked up with a running group um, in, in the Strand, um, um, at, well, in Somerset West and Strand. Um, that th Those days, everybody was still running for Helderberg Harriers and um, uh, happened to be in the dentist chair the one day when my dentist said to me that, oh, you, I hear you're interested in running. You should come and run with our group. And um, he's the guy that I now live with in, in Canada. <laughs> okay. um, but, so we started running and we ran together. And um, I think just the lung capacity that I had from swimming and the diligence. I mean, we, we are crazy people that stare at the black line up and down for hours on end. And I come from the era where we did high mileage swimming. I mean, we were 8,000, 9,000 meters session. Um, and um, so I just, I just grew to love it. And I remember the day that I ran my first marathon, I sent a picture and I landed up next to a guy, the photo of me with the, the defense force guy. Um, he was also a former swimmer. And, um, that was my first marathon and we finished in the stadium at Stellenbosch University in the athletic stadium at Kutzenberg. And it was quite exciting because Santa had, had heard that I was running and she let the squad out early. And so all the swimmers were lined up at the end of, of the marathon. And that was the start for me. And I became hungry and then actually too hungry because with excessive miles come injuries. And yeah. um, so that led me to, dabbled in triathlon afterwards because then I could swim and bike as a relief from the running. So that's basically how it happened. And um, I still run. I run six to seven times a week now at my ripe old age. I just keep going on it. So that's really how it happened. I was missing the swimming so much. I wanted to keep myself busy. Well, I can, I can testify that I never thought I could run. So running was not even in my, in my frame of mind. And when, when I heard you, you ran the foot of Africa and you broke the ladies uh, half marathon record and ran many marathons. It always sort of stuck in the back of my head in the army. I started running and my first full marathon was the foot of Africa. I thought of you and I remember you ran it. And I recently did my 102nd half marathon. When I did my hundredth, my son joined me. He was a matric and he ran his first marathon. And I did. So you not only helped me in swimming and really inspired me in swimming, I can promise you the fact that I'm running and the fact that I believe the swimmer can run, you, the, you are the reason for that as well. And running has given me many, many, many great, 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 uh, you know, joys and, and events. So thanks for that as well. In fact, that was the, half, the, the full marathon record in wow. the foot of Africa. It was a full marathon at that stage. I'm not even sure if, um, if the, uh, if there was a half marathon at that stage, maybe there was, I think, because I think Ilana was like 13 or so, 11 or 13 when she ran it. Um, I just remember after winning the, mar the, the marathon at Foot of Africa, how appalled I was because the men's winner won a thousand rand and I won a hundred rand. <laughs> so I always remember that. That's, a, that's quite an interesting debate that's currently ongoing in just about every, every sport. And um, I mean, it's, it's reasons like that, that, that started the conversation and why we have more equality now. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned uh, triathlon, and I remember you became an Olympic triathlon coach, but before that, you also partake, uh, partook in some uh, Ironman. Tell us more yeah. about how did that happen? Uh, it, was, it was really a strange thing. I went through a funny phase of my life where I felt as if, man, I haven't achieved anything. 
you know, and I kind of want to do something unique and different and so on. And um, uh, I, I um, decided to dabble a little bit in, in triathlon, but I'll tell you exactly how it came about. Um, one of our young swimmers, and you will remember, he's, he's not, he's a young, he's an older married man now, but one of our, he was a young swimmer, he's a 16 year old in our squad, went to um, surf lifesaving championships up, north, up in, in the KwaZulu-Natal region and had an accident and was paralyzed. Harry. And um, yeah, Harry Bell, a delightful young man and a super talented swimmer. Right? Um, and um, it, it, made a huge impression on me. I visited him a long time and then I heard that the Surf Lifesaving Club was going to do a fundraiser um, for Harry and it was going to be a triathlon. So I got myself an old rally bicycle <laughs> and um, knew that I could swim a bit and knew that I could run a bit and I did it and was hooked. And so I, I did that and then I did a couple of races in PE and um, I went and did the Durban Ultra and qualified to race uh, world long distance champs in Nice, France, yeah. an age group, old, the, old, the old guns, and um, came second in my age group at world championships and then decided, okay, well, the next thing is Hawaii Ironman, so let me try and do that. So I went over first to Germany to Roth and did a fantastic, amazing race there. Um, and then. Um, did Hawaii Ironman. Um, I unfortunately in that year developed um, arterial iliac artery problems. So I was just running on and competing on borrowed time. And shortly after that, I had pretty major arterial surgery. Um, so that was really the end of, of that for me. Um, but during that whole time, people approached me and asked me if I would coach them. And uh, one of those people was Conrad Stoltz, who I coached for 11 years. The um, caveman. Yes, the caveman. And, and again, he was my education in triathlon. He opened doors for me because he, he just got on with it. I, he let me um, do what I thought I needed to do and trusted me and, and um, has, is a great gate, what I always called a great keeper of his own body. So he would be able to give me really good in, uh, input and feedback. And so over the, the years I, I coached and I'm, I, I coached Conrad and Liesl, uh, Conrad Stoltz and Liesl were to uh, the inaugural Olympic triathlon in Sydney. And then Kate Roberts and, and uh, Marie Rabi in Beijing um, and, uh, and several other athletes. And it was during the time that I was preparing um, Conrad that, the United States contacted me and asked me if I would take over their program. And so I probably the happiest days of my life work-wise have will always be my almost 19 years of lecturing at UWC. Um, I love teaching. I love the students. I love the opportunities it gave and I believed in what the university stood for. So it was hard for me to pack up and go. Um, the people that I lectured with are still some of the closest friends that I have in the whole world. And I still maintain contact with them. And I went off to the United States. It was a very tough gig. Um, and I persisted for almost five years there before returning home. Um, but during that time I was offered a job with the international federation as the development director to develop the sport globally, globally and find athletes and, train coaches and I did that for seven years um, working um, in South Africa from South Africa because I did a lot of work in Africa and Asia um, and then I went back to um, as things happened in my life and progressed I moved to Canada and continued because the head office for um, International Federation was in Vancouver mm -hmm. did a short stint with um, Triathlon Canada before I was offered an opportunity that I could not refuse in the job that I now currently hold, which has absolutely nothing to do with swimming, biking, or running, uh, because I'm a high performance director for winter sports oh. or winter the games. So I work only with winter sports right now. That is incredible. Libby, you've, you've had just such an amazing journey and uh, such a wide variety of sports you've touched. You've competed in, uh, I know we haven't even touched on that, but I know you were 
a very good hockey player as well. And I mean, uh, no, no, you... not, very, not very good. I played hockey and I was a goalkeeper actually, but I did play hockey, yes. But right. I was not great for sure. So, but, but I think that that's what made you a great coach is that you were on the other side as well, you know. And I'm not saying that all great coaches had to be on the other side. I mean, that's been proven in World Cup rugby where people who didn't play for the Spring Moss won World Cups as coaches. And so, but uh, I always felt, you know, and I still remember in Paul where every now and again you'd put on your costume and you'd swim with us. You know, I think it's very important for someone to also feel what the person on the other side of being coached feels like so that you can have a bit of you know, insight into that as well. Uh, yeah, that, really, that was really, um, you know, multi-sport uh, triathlon and it came into being when I was almost an old lady already. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I was fascinated by it um, and, and decided that there is absolutely no way um, that I can coach it unless I experience it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, but, when I went over to do German Ironman and then I flew directly to Europe and I stayed in a, like a little back room where basically I could lie in my bed and my bicycle was next to me. And that, and I had this one plate that I cooked on and so on preparing myself for, for Hawaii. Um, you know, and those weren't the days where we had cell phones and laptops and can connect with each other. I had to reverse charges to anybody that was actually interested in talking to me back home. And um, so that was an experience and, and that's the life that a pro athlete starts out as before they become successful. You know, my story's pale in comparison to how Conrad started out. And I know that Conrad's writing a book, so I don't want to reveal all his stories, but I mean, he, he would, if he didn't have a place to sleep, he would get a place in a cell in France at a, at a, at a police station and sleep yeah. in his bike bag. Yeah. So that, that's kind of how the, the athletes start out. And so it was hard for me as a 40 something year old um, doing that. Um, but it was an experience that, that I puts me on the right side with the athletes because I know what they're going through. They're not all high money spinners, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the athletes just speak so highly of, of the way you, you treated them. And, and uh, so you, so you actually from, from a South African perspective, went to two Olympics with, with a, with a triathletes. Uh, I have been I have been to a number of of Olympic games now. So I went um, in um, and that this is an interesting. So I went with the South African team as the coach manager of of the athletes. They were both my athletes. Um, it was a kind of a sad occasion because there were many other athletes that qualified, but the South African Saskok in those days uh, Nox had decided not to select all of them. So it could have been a bigger team. So I went with Liesl and, and Conrad cause I was their personal coach at that stage. Um, and then um, I went to work in the USA. So I went to Athens as part of the, uh, as a team leader for the United States team. That's when I won, won a bet wearing the American uniform, won a bet that our men's four by hundred freestyle relay would win gold at the olympics oh, <laughs> so, right. so anyway so that that was i went to athens then i went when i went to beijing um in 2008 i went as the official on-site announcer i was the announcer the the what they call the color color commentary announcer in the stadium um for uh, all television channels for 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 the triathlon there in london i went just as part of my role with um, ITU. Um, that was, I knew that was going to be my last gig. Um, I did not go to Rio because I resigned from Triathlon Canada before that and moved over to winter sport. And then in 2018, I went to Pyeongchang, South Korea with um, the, um, on the podium with Canada as their part of their, basically just a support team um, for, for the at the sports that I work with. I work with seven uh, um, winter Olympic sports right now. That is incredible. So your dream has come true and you are living the dream. What, what's left for Libby Burrell? Is this still something on the bucket list, uh, sports-wise, coaching-wise, uh, as an athlete, something you want to do? What's on the bucket list still? Um, I, um, I feel very privileged to be in the job that I'm in. And I feel it's a culmination of... Um, I, I, when I work with the sports, I say, um, I can help you out because I've made all the mistakes in the book 
and and I've learned the lessons out of all those mistakes. If you only do everything right, you don't learn too much, right? So um, I feel very, very privileged. I, I hope to be side by side with my sports till Beijing. Um, I'm getting long in the tooth now. I'm next year. I'm 65, so I'm a true senior next year. Um, I would like to contribute to Canadian sport as long as I can. Um, I think you probably know that I really wanted to contribute to South African sport, but a, a lot of us that progressed and moved elsewhere went back, and and they weren't really ready to to take a lot of the people back. But Canada has given me a new life and so many privileges and so many opportunities, and I'm. I'm, I feel as if I'm now in the second best job in my career and, and I would like to contribute there as much as possible. And for me, I just want to stay healthy uh, for as long as I can and, and um, keep moving and keep active. I'm a terrible skier. Um, I look like an African on a downhill slope. Um, and I, I like cross country skiing, but again, I'm terrible at it. I keep doing it. Um, and here we learn, you adapt. I put crampons on shoes and I run out in the deep snow here um, and just stay healthy. Um, so I would like to give back um, as much as I can. And um, I think if I had to, had to go back to anything that I loved the most, it would be coaching swimming. Wow. Well, and that, that was, uh, I love working with young people and very young people. Like um, I remember, and uh, I'm allowed to mention athletes' names, I'm sure. I remember um, when I came across and, and started working with Tessa Loft. And Tessie was one of the stars. She was beautiful. Um, and I remember we were on the train. Some of the photos I sent you of, of us at the station heading to Sasselberg Winter Championships. Uh, in those freezing cold, but warm water, freezing cold air and very warm water. And Tessie was about nine then. And she had to swim her first individual medley. And she um, had written down on a piece of paper what time she wanted to swim for each length. And it was her first one. And she was comma four out of what she estimated. Wow. A little, and so I'm just real. to see those kids form and develop and think and, and you know, be cognitive about everything that they're doing. Um, I just think you have such an opportunity as a coach if, you, if you're good with the kids is to, to shape them and help them develop. And sure, I look back and many times I lie in bed thinking of mistakes I made and what I would have liked to have done better and what I would have liked to have done differently but as coaches we're also human and as long as your value system is good and you keep returning to that then that, that's really um, the name of the game well I can say it was very sad when I heard you were going to leave South Africa and uh, I, I, I can't say you were lost for South African sport you are such a big part of the history of South African swimming and for that matter triathlon and even road running and uh, you've, you've played such a major part in not just my life, in so many kids' lives who now are now adults and who can now use that uh, and, and transform their kids into better people. So for that, I'll forever, forever be grateful that you've, you've played a massive part of my life. And I hope you continue to play a part of my life because I really love connecting with you. I love chatting to you. I love seeing you. And uh, keep on returning to South Africa. I'm sure you've still got your house here in South Africa and I'm sure you... You guys will keep on coming back to drink our wines. <laughs> I most definitely will. Um, and, you know, wherever we go, we make contact with the other people. I don't know when you spoke to John T. If he told you that his office was just like a, around the corner from mine and we used to meet up regularly. Um, um, I think that if you have a look at the, the group of the old time swimmers now that have connected with each other, um, and I can only really speak um, of the Eastern province because that was really, you know, Eastern province, Western province, but Eastern province was a large part of my life. My dad was president of swimming there and, and um, was kind of, um, kind of a, a role model for a lot of us, but we still keep in touch. All of those people that I swim with, we still keep in touch. And, and I think that's, that's the most important thing. It's not just um, you, you train with somebody and then they move off. But one of the things that we expect as coaches, you know, some of the people you'll maintain contact with and some people will just move on, but the impression that they've left on you remains with you forever. And I think that's really 
um, how, how I see it. Um, I'm getting on that side of my life now that, that I keep thinking, what could I have done better? And so now I try to focus on what can I do now and yeah. what can I do playing it forward? Well, it's all in the now. Libby, it, 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 as the first of many uh, talks, I think we need to chat again. Uh, there's just so much that, that you've, you've given to the sport and that you continue to give to the sport. Thanks so much for your time. Love to you. I can't yeah, wait well, to come back to South Africa and we can have a proper catch up and a proper chat. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Thanks for thinking of me. Thanks. Take Libby. care. Bye.